So uh, what we're going to look at today is uh, some popular misconceptions about Christmas. This will be fun. You've got a handout. We'll look at five things that uh, are, are common misconceptions about the story. All right, uh, we've got five little misconceptions that uh, we'll take a look at this morning. The first one, let's take a look at Luke chapter 2. And the first uh, misconception is this. The question is, when they arrived in Bethlehem, there was no room for Joseph and Mary in the what? Yeah. Okay, that's the, that's the popular misconception, number one, is that there was no room for them in the end. Okay, so let's look at the passage. Chapter 2, and let's we'll read verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there is no place for them in the end. All right, I'm reading out the ESV. Does anybody have something different? King James says it. In? Uh, NIV says? No guest room available. Okay, there's no guest room available for them. Anything else besides ESV, New King James, NIV? All right, so let's take a look at this word. The the Greek word that's used here in this translation of N is uh, this word, kataluma. And this word is only used uh, three times in the New Testament. And it's used twice in the, this is the abbreviation for Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So it's not used very often, but... uh, this is the only time in our English translations it's translated as in. Okay? So let's look at the other places and see where it's, how it's translated in those uh, locations. So flip in Luke over the chapter 22 of Luke. And look at verses 7 through 12. This is... Um, The Passover, Jesus and his disciples are about to uh, partake in together. And see see if you can pick out the word Cataluma here in uh, this passage. Then came the day of unleavened bread, in verse 7, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover. All right, which word do you think is the word cataluma? It is. It's the it's guest room. There are two rooms here, right? There's an, an upper room and a guest room. The, the large upper room, that's not the word cataluma, but the word guest room is uh, the one used here. And this is in Luke uh, twenty-two seventeen. Now there's a parallel passage in Mark, which is the same uh, passage, same event. It's Mark 14, 14. Same thing. This word Cataluma is used here in Mark and it's translated as guest room. And those are the three instances in uh, the New Testament where that word is used. Twice in Luke and once in Mark. Now, in Luke, it's used twice. Now, generally, when an author uses a word more than one time, generally, it should be translated the same way. Okay? But uh, it's translated in two different ways here. So the question is, where, where were Joseph and Mary staying when they came into Bethlehem to have the baby Jesus? We most often think of this word in our context as like Motel 8, right? Or something like that, right? It's a motel or a hotel and Joseph and Mary come there. And what has happened throughout history is that the story has been embellished with details that aren't in the, in the text, right? 
So there's one character in the Christmas story that's kind of the bad guy. Who's the bad guy in the Christmas story? Yeah. Well, Herod is the bad guy. Very good, Benjamin. You are right. He's the worst bad guy. Yeah. But who else? Innkeeper. The innkeeper. There's no innkeeper in the Christmas story. He's not in Scripture. But the story you're used to hearing is that Joseph and Mary are looking for a place to stay. And they go to the motel. And they ask for a place to stay. And the innkeeper says, there's no room for you here. Get out of here. Go. Everything's full. There's, there's no vacancy allowed in the motel room. But that, that dude's not in scripture anywhere. That's an embellishment that has happened later to the story, likely because of this translation of the word in here. All right. Now, that idea, it's not like they didn't have inns or motels or hotels at that time, because they did. And Luke actually uses a different Greek word for this type of lodging place. So if you remember, let's flip there, Luke chapter 10. You'll remember this story. It's a popular story. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. And in verse, uh, we'll read, no, it's verse 34. Luke uses a word that has a very specific meaning, meaning in. All right, here it is. Uh, He went to him and bound up his wounds, right? This is the Samaritan taking care of the guy who's been robbed and beaten. He bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him there, right? This is a Greek word that is pandokeion. And uh, looks like this. Which has a very tight, specific definition. This is a motel. This is a hotel, right? This is an inn. But but Luke doesn't use this word in 2.7. He uses this word, Cataluma, instead. Okay? Now, Cataluma has flexibility in it with the way that it, has, it is used in both Scripture and in antiquity. Not the case for this word, right? This word only and always means in. But Cataluma kind of can have a broad range of meanings. So, in, uh, here's the two instances in the Septuagint. In Exodus 4.24... This is the passage where God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh to get him to let the people of Israel go. And as he leaves the land of Midian and goes to Egypt, he stops along the point away at a lodging place. And that's where God comes to destroy him because he hasn't circumcised his son. So the word there, lodging place, is, is this word in the Greek. It's a different word in the Hebrew, but this is what the translators used to translate it. So lodging place, it's a, maybe a campsite, just an oasis. It's, it's some kind of place where he stays the night. Maybe it's an inn, like an official kind of motel place. Uh, it also could be the guest room of, of a family or something like that. So that's one usage of it. Now the second one is uh, 1 Samuel 9.22. And uh, what happens here is uh, Samuel brings Saul and Saul's uh, armor bearer young man with him and they bring, he brings him into a guest room to prepare a meal. All right. Now that sounds very similar to what we read in Luke 22 where Jesus and the disciples go into an upper room or guest room to, to have a meal together. So you know, the instance here is also like this guest room. And this can be something like a campsite or possibly an inn here. All right, so, so what's going on here? Number one, we see the misconception that the innkeeper character is an embellishment from tradition or history that's not in the text. But secondly, if you think about what's going on at the time, why are Joseph and Mary going to Bethlehem in the first place? To register for that section. All right, the register for taxation, and why do they go to Bethlehem? All right, all right, that's the place where their ancestors are from, right? So where Joseph's are anyway. So Joseph returns to the, the city of his ancestors, and most likely, who's he going to be staying with? Relatives. Family. Yeah, he's got relatives that live in Bethlehem. So they come to the house of their relatives, and in the house of the relatives, they have a guest room. That's common. This is common for the the houses of this time. They have a guest room. But the guest room is filled up with what? 
other, other relatives. relatives. All right. So there's no room for them in the guest room. So instead, there's another room in the house that is often used to house yeah. animals. They don't have anywhere to go, so that's all we got left is the, the place where the animals are usually kept. And so that's probably where the manger comes from, right? The manger is in that room. And so this is a, a popular misconception, number one, here, that most likely... Now, it doesn't mean this is definitely not an inn, but most likely it's not an inn, based on the translation here and here and the, the usage of it elsewhere, both in the Septuagint and other places. But this is likely the guest room of Joseph's family. It's filled up, so they don't have enough room for them to stay. Mary goes into labor, and they have that quiet area where the animals usually stay to give them for uh, Mary to have the baby. So that's misconception number one. Has anybody heard this one before? That this is a guest room and not the inn? Okay, a couple. Okay, good. Misconception number one, most likely there, no place for them to stay in the guest room. Now the next couple of misconceptions we have all come from the same story. And this is the story about the wise men. So the first... uh, question we have here is when did the star appear okay so when you the popular misconception is what when do you see the star displayed all right and uh when you set up your nativity where's the star over the manger manger, all right so the popular picture is that the star appears over the manger on the night of jesus birth Okay, that's the popular misconception. But as we look at this passage, Matthew, this is Matthew chapter 2, it should say on your handout. Let's read the passage all the way through and then we'll look at these three questions. Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house... They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, we're, we're talking about the star here first. On the, we didn't read this, but you know it. On the night when the angels appear to the shepherds. That's the night of Jesus' birth, okay? The night the angel appears to the shepherds and then the whole heavenly host breaks forth and appears. What's the sign that the angel gives the shepherds? The baby wrapped in swaddling claws lying in a manger. If there was a big giant star over the manger, don't you think the angel would have said, just look at the star right there and you'll find out where the baby is? All right. So it's likely that the star did not appear just from that passage alone in Luke. That's Luke chapter 2. The star did not appear on the night of Jesus' birth. Okay, So that's, that's number two, misconception. So uh, in the nativity, we often see the star over uh, the, the nativity. But uh, most likely that's not the case. So that brings us to number three here. When... Did the wise men come? <coughs> All right, now there are a couple of clues in this passage as far as answering the question when. When did the wise men come? 
So look here in verse 1. What's the first clue about when is the time? Right at the beginning. After Jesus was born. Now that could have been one minute after he was born. Maybe. Right? But that's our first clue. This is in verse 1. The wise men showed up after Jesus was born. Now there's another uh, timing clue in verse 2. See if you can pick it out there. It's a little more subtle. We saw his star when it rose after Okay, so good. And look at the sentence before that. Same thing, similar to number one here. Yeah, and that's it. Okay? So Jesus has been born. All right? That's not just past tense. Let the English scholars tell me what the tense is there. I don't... Past perfect tense, okay? Which means what? You remember? Something that's already been completed, right? So again, if we're being strict, maybe they showed up 15 minutes after Jesus was born. He's been born already. He was after he was born. But the, the thrust seems to be here that, that, that some time has passed since the birth of Jesus. Now it gets a little bit more uh, clear in just a second here. In verse 1, and this gives us more of a broad time range to put us in history. In verse 1, give us a broad time range uh, that Luke, uh, that Matthew gives us there. Sorry. Okay, he's appearing. Okay, yeah. good. <clears throat> okay, now this is just going to give us a broad time range in history. Uh, King Herod died in November of 4 B.C. Okay, so this is just giving us a bit of a broad time range here. <laughs> so we know that they didn't come way later after Jesus was born, right? Because it says that they came to see the child. So that could mean anything from an infant to a young boy. But it wasn't like he was eight or something like that, right? So it puts an end cap on when the wise men showed up. Uh, no later than 4 B.C. because they came during the days of Herod and they went and interacted with Herod. Now here's the next time cue. Look at verse 8. <clears throat> Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem. Is that where Joseph and Mary live? No, where do they live? Nazareth. Nazareth. And, and you know Nazareth's up north in Israel. Bethlehem's down south near Jerusalem. So Joseph and Mary are still in Bethlehem at this point when the wise men come. Okay. <laughs> so again, this helps us kind of narrow down a little bit more where they are. So they've had the baby Jesus, but they're staying in Bethlehem. And it makes sense. They would stay a while until they decide to make the journey way back up north to Nazareth, right? They're going to wait for the baby to, to grow so it's a little bit safer and easier to travel all the way back up to Nazareth. So in verse 8, they're still in Bethlehem. And here's the next one. And this really kind of gives us a more succinct timeline here in verse 16. <clears throat> And you know this is, 16 helps us really kind of understand when they show up. Because look at verse 7 first. Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. All right. So Herod has a couple of things that he's trying to figure out. But he tells them, tell me exactly when did the star appear? Because he wants to know about what he's got planned coming up here. Right. So he wants to know when the star appeared. And um, in verse 16, which we didn't read, but look past it. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. All right, so Herod gets the wise men and tell them when the star appears... And now Herod realizes he's been tricked by the wise men. And Herod, as he 
has been known to do is furious and kills all the boys two years old and under. Why does he kill the boys two years old and under? Yeah, all right. So you can imagine if he's trying to wipe out the king, he's probably going to hedge his bets and go a little bit higher and a little bit lower based on when the star appeared just to make sure he's going to kill Jesus. So probably, so let's see, this is... um, Two years old and under are all the babies that he kills. So probably no later than two years, right, after Jesus' birth do the wise men come. But obviously it's, it's after Jesus' birth while they're still in Bethlehem. So we're thinking if you take a middle point in the time when Herod chooses to kill the, the babies, we're looking at one year mark. Somewhere probably around there, it's safe to say, that the wise men didn't come to Bethlehem until about a year, give or take, after Jesus was born. All right, but when do you see the wise men displayed in the nativity? Yeah, right? So the wise men are there, the shepherds are there, the angels are there, the star is there. But that's just a popular misconception. The story's been all combined into one event, one scene that we see commonly at Christmas time. <clears throat> so if you set up your nativity, where do you need to put the wise men? You need to put them kind of across the room, and then maybe you can kind of slowly move them closer throughout the Christmas season. They're, they're getting there, right? Um, and uh, traditionally in the church calendar, there's uh, a feast celebrating when the wise men arrive. Does anybody know when that is? January 6th. January 6th, yeah. So uh, traditionally, the, uh, this is just church calendar tradition. The birth of Jesus is on the 25th of December, and then January 6th is the is the arrival of the wise men. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is the third misconception about when the wise men came. So most likely they have come significantly after Jesus has been born. Now let's look at the next one. You probably know this one, but how many wise men were there? More than one. Three on one <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the popular misconception, right? That there were three wise men. But scripture doesn't say there were three wise men. Okay. Right. And it's most likely because of the gifts. Because if you look at verse 11, this is where the gifts are mentioned. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So there are three gifts that are mentioned, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there were three kings. If you look throughout the passage... It's plural, usage of pronouns and that sort of thing, right? The verbs are also in plural. So that means there were at least two, right? I heard somebody say there were at least two of them. There could have been 12 of them. Uh, There could have been three of them. But we know that there are at least uh, two of them that are present. So where where do the three come from? It it comes out of the gifts, but in in ancient church history, there's also a tradition of these three kings, Uh, I gave you a hint here. Kings. What, what are the names of these guys? Do you remember? Caspar. Caspar is one. Melchior. Yep. And? Oh, that's right. So here's where this tradition comes from. What's uh, traditionally said about these three guys is that they, are, they were kings. So that's where we get the song, We Three Kings of Orient are, right? Okay. So Caspar was uh, said to be a king from India. Melchior was a king from Persia. And Balthazar was a king from Arabia. This is the tradition. And uh, this goes back to the earliest, that, at least that we have, so far, there's a Greek manuscript from Alexandria, Egypt. <clears throat> About the year 500 A.D. Okay, That was translated into Latin, which mentions these three kings, these guys. That, that this is who they are, who the wise men are. So it's a, an ancient tradition. Right, at least from where we are today, but also it's 500 years after the fact. 
But there's a continuance of this tradition uh, throughout church history where there was uh, another Greek manuscript from 800 A.D. Um, which, interestingly, the Greek manuscript is thought to have originated from Ireland. Okay? But the gospel went into Ireland very early in the history of the church. Anybody remember when it was starting to go into Ireland? 300s. Yeah, the Romans actually paved the way for that to happen. Uh, so very early on, it made it all the way into Ireland. So it could be, it could be an ancient source, but it's a, a Greek translation, most likely from some kind of Celtic or Gaelic language of Ireland, that carries on this tradition. So it isn't, it's an ancient tradition in the church. It's not something recent that's, that's come up. But again, there's no, there's no evidence, historically speaking, to support that this is the case. It's just uh, information that's been passed down through church history uh, here as well. So how many wise men were there? At least two, but we can't say for certain. There, there are three of them there. But you can see where that comes from now. Right? Okay. Number five is, uh, Shelly, where you were going earlier. Why December 25th? All right, so what are some of the popular misconceptions that you hear about why this is on this date? What are some things you have heard? Okay. All right. This is the popular misconception. So you, you nailed it. All right. So the, the the popular story or thing that people like to say, especially folks who are uh, want to kind of poke the eye of Christians or something like that. So there's this pagan holiday called Sol Invictus, or the Unconquerable Sun. All right, Sol, like solar, right? The Unconquerable Sun. So there's this um, festival day that was celebrated in the 4th century. It's the earliest evidence we have that this was celebrated in the, in the Roman Empire. 4th century, 300s is what we're talking about, mid, late 300s. It's so where we start to see this being celebrated. And it was celebrated around... The 25th, because of why? What's going on at this time of year? It's the winter solstice, right? <coughs> so this comes from uh, wanting to celebrate. It's the end of the darkening of the days and the beginning of the lightening of the days, right? So the unconquerable sun, right? You get that. So the popular misconception is that Christians overtook. They chose this holiday to celebrate the birth of Christ, to kind of take over this pagan a holiday festival. But in reality, there's no historical evidence that that's what happened or that that was the case. But that's what the popular line is from folks that you will hear. That that's why Christians do that. Now, did Christians do stuff like this throughout history? Yeah, they did. They're trying to renew the culture, right? Move it out of its paganism and into uh, the kingdom of Christ. But in this instance, this is not, there's no historical evidence that this is what was happening. Uh, here And the reason is, this date for the celebration of Christmas precedes this festival. So we have church documents and history from before the time that this was celebrated, that Christmas was already being celebrated on the 25th of December, before this was even the case. So, where then does the, the date come from? Uh, here, all right, here we go. Here's a little bit of history for you. So, there's an early church father named John Chrysostom. Anybody heard of him? Okay. Anybody remember what his name means? The Golden Tongued. All right. He was known for his beautiful preaching. He was a great, eloquent preacher. John the Golden, Golden Tongued. So he preaches a sermon in 386 AD about this idea of Christmas being on the 25th. Now, he's not the first to do this. But this is where we have some real solid historical uh, information about this. And, the, and he actually references an earlier uh, work showing the same thing. But here's how it works. All right. In the Gospels, Zechariah and Luke is a priest, right? He's in the temple doing his priestly duties. And he's a priest according to the class of Abijah. So this is Luke 
one five. Okay. Now I'm cutting through a lot of detail just to give you the succinct argument here. But in Luke one five, we know that Zechariah is a priest according to Abijah. All right, Abijah was the eighth class of priests to serve. So flip over to 2 Chronicles 24. You can see how this works. 2 Chronicles 24. And we're looking at verse 10 here. Now this is, this is to help you put this in context. In the English Old Testament, Chronicles is here. Because chronologically, the story of the Old Testament, the historical order of the books, is following chronology. In the Hebrew order of the Old Testament books, Chronicles is only one book. And it's the last book of the Old Testament. Okay, So Chronicles is the last book of the Old Testament which puts us closer to the time of Christ, right? As far as the Old Testament writings are concerned. All right, so look at uh, verse 10 here. This is about uh, the repairing of the temple, and this gives us some insight into these classes of priests here. So here it's David organizing the priests. Verse 7, let's start at verse 7. There are these different classes of priests that are now being scheduled to perform their duties in the temple. Verse 7, the first lot fell to Jehoiarib, the second to Jediah, the third to Harim, the fourth to Seorim, the fifth to Malkijah, the sixth to Mijamin, the seventh to Hakaz, the eighth to Abijah, the ninth to Jeshua, the tenth to Shechaniah, the eleventh to Eliashib, the twelfth to Jachim, and so on all the way down until they get to number 24, the 24th to Isaiah. So there are 24 classes of priests who have rotating duties in the temple. Everybody tracking what's going on so far? Okay. So each class of priests served twice two weeks out of the year. Okay. They're rotating the schedule. 24, one time. The class of Abijah Abijah serves one time in the first 24 rotations. Then it goes back and there's another 24 rotations, right? So two weeks out of the year, the class of Abijah is serving in the temple. All right? Following me? Okay? So that means Zechariah would be in the temple two weeks out of the year when the angel appeared. One of two weeks, the angel appears to Zechariah while he's serving in the temple. Now, based on the, the dating of when these folks are in the temple... That historically, what happens to the temple in 70 AD struck, is struck down, right? It's destroyed. But we have records for who was serving during the time when the temple was destroyed. Okay? So if you know who's serving during the time the temple was destroyed, what can you do? Work backwards. backwards, right? So if you work backwards to figure out when was the Abijah serving during the time Jesus would have been born, <laughs> there are a couple of options, but the most likely option is that... <clears throat> Uh, in October, and here's the week, it's 3 through 10 of 6 BC. Abijah would have been, that class of priests would have been serving in the temple. And so Zechariah would have been in the temple October 3rd through 10th in 6 BC. All right, so he's serving in the temple, and the angel appears to him and tells him, You're going to have a son, John the Baptist. Okay? Now, we can then calculate. When probably was John the Baptist conceived? How soon after you went back? Where is it? Probably on the tenth. Okay, <laughs> probably on the tenth. All right. So Zachariah's been told you're going to have a son, and he's got this great news, and he and he goes home to Elizabeth, and they conceive John the Baptist. Probably on or about October tenth, or shortly thereafter. Okay. In 6 BC. Now, what else do we know? All right, this is John and his conception. All right. What do we know about the timing when Mary went to visit Elizabeth? Okay, all right. So, she was in her sixth month. All right, is what... Okay. 
Okay? So let's count November, December, January, February, March, but not to April because she's not past six months, but she's in her sixth month. All right, so we're sometime between March and April here. And because the church has understood this, and this is in this sermon as well, and this would have been March 25th of 5 BC. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this date. Um, one is this idea here. This puts us in the right time frame. But Jewish history also believed that the world was created on this day. All right. And church history also taught that Jesus died on this day. Okay? So it would make sense then, according to this theology, that this is also where he was conceived, right? There's a new birth of the Messiah, just as the same as the creation of the world, and he, he was born and died on the same day. Okay? So March 25th, B.C. Now, that's Jesus' conception here. Right? Because Mary would have been told by Gabriel, you're going to have a child. That would have happened almost immediately. Right? It's not like Gabriel told her that and then six months later she was pregnant. It would have been an immediate act of creation by God. The Jesus would have been conceived on this day. She then travels up to see Elizabeth in her sixth month at this point. Now, let's calculate nine months later, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Okay? So nine months later is December 25th, 5 BC, and this is the birth of Jesus. Okay? Now, throughout church history, his, nobody knows for sure when Jesus was born. I should, it's a caveat of that thing. But you understand why now it's celebrated on this day, right? And has been from ancient times. Because while John Chrysostom preaches this sermon here about this happening, he references much earlier beliefs about the birth of Jesus. But the birth of Jesus has been celebrated, the actual birth, not just the conception. But his birth has also been celebrated around this time of year, March 25th, and in ancient times during the church calendar, his birth. So Christmas had been celebrated around this time as well. But um, that brings us to December 25th. So the common misconception is this, <clears throat> that all oh, Christians just are celebrating this pagan winter festival, but there's no historical evidence for that. The fact is the church has recognized this date from very ancient times in church history, and this is the reasoning for how they get to for how they get to that date. Now, let me let us end on this. This is the takeaway. What's the point of this? Right, there, there really is a point of looking at this, <clears throat> and it's we come to scripture thinking that we know we don't have any bias, we're not influenced by anything, uh, and we come to scripture and we think we got it. But this is the most well-known story <laughs> in all of scripture, basically, right? But even this most well-known story in all of Scripture is distorted, and we believe things about it that aren't true because of the culture, because of the traditions, because of our own ignorance about actually looking at the text. So we've got to have some humility with, with where we think we've got it all figured out, right, when we come to Scripture. And it, it gives us, one, a check on our humility about our understanding of Scripture, that we think we've got everything figured out, I don't have everything figured out. And nobody, if anybody says they got everything figured out, just go find somebody else to sit on there as far as our teaching is concerned, right? But the second thing it does is it really should help you learn to look and read the text, right? We're not trying to read things into the text that aren't there. We're trying to pull out what is there and understand that, right? That the fancy words are exegesis and eisegesis, right? Exegesis means to pull out the meaning that's in the text, and understand it in its original context and what the author is saying. I said Jesus is where he takes stuff and put it into the text that's not there. And we do that all the time. That's what is happening with these kind of things, right? Take these different things, put them together, and all of a sudden there's an innkeeper who's a mean guy for not letting Joseph and Mary stay in, in the inn. But that's not anywhere in the text. So if it happens in the most well-known story in the Bible, you can imagine that 
in your own personal reading of Scripture, you're doing this elsewhere. And you're not aware of it. So it, it emphasizes those two things. One is to keep a check on, on how much you think you know. You know a lot, believe me. I know you as a congregation. You know a lot. But you don't know everything. And so just have that humility about yourself as you interact with others. And the other thing is to maintain that practice of exegesis, right? Read the text for what's there and understand it for what the author is, is communicating to the original audience. So that, that helps kind of put this into a good perspective here. That that's, that's why we look at things like this, because uh, we, we are influenced whether we realize it or want to believe it or not. So it's good for us to have that check on ourselves.